Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Keenest, let me, let me ask you uh, this. In, in your work in countering violent extremism, I understand that your organization has uh, completed uh, several assessments on women's programming in, in both Iraq and Afghanistan. And correct me if I am wrong, you, you found three areas in need of focus, which is reaching out to rural women, not just those in urban areas, engaging religious leaders, and working with men and boys. Um, can you tell us, first of all, am I correct in, in the way I describe it, and can you tell us why these areas you have been working on and working in are important in countering violent extremism? Yes, thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, first of all, these were uh, assessments that we did uh, both on our work with U.S. government on women's programming in Iraq and in Afghanistan, but also engaged Iraqi and Afghan women. Key issues that they identified is that because so much of the populations, and this would be true in parts of Africa as well, live in rural regions, whatever is happening among perhaps elite educated women in the urban areas is not necessarily the same world that rural women live in. The access to information, uh, certainly uh, television, other forms of uh, ways to learn what is going on in the world is very, very reduced. And their worlds are reduced and much more hierarchical in terms of their status in the family. That is why uh, they recommended that no women's programming should be done in isolation or in a silo without engaging the men in their lives, the fathers, the brothers, the sons, as I mentioned in my testimony, that it is very key to begin engaging with a full gendered perspective, since men are two gendered beings. And we see in ISIS, as mentioned in other testimonies here today, that the concept of what it means to be a real man is being used very strategically by women, by men, to influence young men. And so, again, it is important to bring men into this picture. And finally, of course, religious leaders who, for the most part in our world today, are men. And so we must engage them in, uh, certainly in uh, their perspectives on the role of women, uh, both in the home and in public life, and also in the role that they can play in preventing violence. I did want to comment just very briefly on the Soviet Central Asia space, particularly in Kyrgyzstan. A year ago, we did a session with young university students in Kyrgyzstan, and they identified this issue of uh, violent extremism, which they felt was growing, especially in the south of their country. It was related to the fact that 70 years they were a secular country. They knew nothing about what Islam was. And indeed, the very first uh, propaganda, if you will, was the Wahhabis who entered into South uh, Central Asia. And so part of the dilemma that they recommended to us was that we need to have much more engaged religious dialogue between religious experts on Islam and, uh, and secular uh, uh, populations so that people are understanding what is uh, real Islam versus what is being promoted or propagated by uh, uh, extremist groups. Thank you very much. What have, what, what have you found? Um, is the major difference between women in urban areas and women in rural areas? What, are the, what, what have you found in your work that makes it harder for one group or another? Very simply, time. Women living in rural regions often are having to access water, food, any kind of efforts on behalf of their children or uh, parents by foot. By, by foot. It's not, whereas in an urban setting, there is uh, transportation options available to them. So time is of the essence. And the number of um, uh, commitments that they have to make sure that there is food, that there is uh, uh, care for children and elderly, all of that very much limits their bandwidth in an everyday world.
Radio is the best access, and we have found great success in our programs in South Sudan, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, using radio as a way to help uh, shape these messages. Thank you. Let me, let me quickly, uh, Mr. Watts, ask you, we saw a little clip of your, of your film. It seemed extraordinary to me. Um, it, it seems to me that the Yazidi lawyer could be living in a, in a comfortable place, in a comfortable life somewhere else in the world, and yet he risks everything uh, to save these women and these girls. I would like you to tell us a little more about that. What do you think drives him to do this, and how can uh, he inspire others to help? Um, what is the Iraqi government doing about the situation? Um, the missions this lawyer undertakes uh, cannot be cheap. How much do they cost, and who is funding them? Yeah. Well, he is an extraordinary individual because, as you say, he's taken this on uh, pretty much individually. There are about six guys, six or seven guys, who are actually involved in trying to organize these rescues. Uh, and they've essentially come up with a methodology completely off their own back, uh, gathering information from women who've returned, making contact with people inside ISIS territory who don't agree with their views or, or who are willing to help the network for money, as you say. Um, so. It, He's an extraordinary character. There aren't many people like him necessarily, and I think he's doing it simply because this atrocity is so devastating to his community. It's an extremely conservative community, the Yazidis, uh, where honor is very important. Men and women live very separate lives, and ISIS has crashed in and essentially uh, really hit the foundation of their community and the future of their community, uh, because a lot of young boys have also been taken and are now being indoctrinated in ISIS's ideas. In terms of the support they're getting, the Kurdish regional government has uh, set up an office, the Office for the Affairs of Kidnapped People, which does, uh, in a slightly ad hoc way, provide funds towards the, uh, to these rescue missions. Sometimes those missions occur for free because there are people inside ISIS territory who are so opposed to ISIS's ideas, they're willing to do it for humanitarian reasons. There are other people who are so impoverished by the blockade of ISIS territory, they're willing to help. There was a shepherd that was, I knew about who for $100 guided uh, something like 20 people through the mountains. Um, but the problem is, this is all, as Halil himself described it to me, it's a DIY operation. And that's one of the messages that I'm hoping to get across to all of you today, is that these guys are doing extraordinary work inside ISIS territory. And through their work, we learn a much more realistic uh, picture about what it's actually like inside ISIS territory. There are people opposed to their rule. It is a dictatorship enforcing a certain system of rules on a local population. And I think that their efforts could be supported in that way. And their work is also potentially giving us important intelligence that could guide a, a broader strategy as well. We'll go to, thank you, we'll go to Chris Smith.